Tonight we travel through New York to the frenetic sounds of John Zorn and Sonic Youth. Hello, New York's still one of the richest arts communities in the world, a multi-ethnic cauldron of musical styles and an internationally renowned showcase for the arts in general. In many ways, the esteem associated with success in New York has been strengthened by the increasing odds against achieving it. For the past 50 years, the city has been the home of many highly influential musicians and musical genres. John Cage in the 40s, Ornette Coleman, Miles Davis and Charlie Parker in the 50s. In the 60s, Folk City provided the first performance venue for folk artists like Bob Dylan and Joan Baez, while Max's Kansas City was housing the Velvet Underground. In the 70s, the New York Dolls, Ramones, Patti Smith and Television, and later Blondie and Talking Heads. In the 80s, it's difficult to identify any particular rock avant-garde sound likely to develop into a major movement, as the scene is so fragmented it almost defies definition. Yet from this environment come musicians who, influenced by diverse musical styles, have developed an individual sound and emerged as influential New York artists. Tonight, Put Blood in the Music, a film by New York director Charles Atlas, features John Zorn and the band Sonic Youth. Both Zorn and Sonic Youth are currently riding high. The film, very much a New York artifact, looks at how living in New York influences the music these artists make. You may think that its style and pace reflect the frenetic quality and the self-consciousness of that music and of the city itself. Loud, violent, non-stop energy. Couldn't live without it. I think if there's a New York sound, it's probably the sound of people looking for cheap apartments more than anything else. New York downtown music, there's, there's just too many different elements appearing all the time and, and keeping it constantly active and changing. There's a white noise of the city sounds, there's street musicians, there's... Check it out, right I've always been uh, looking for the, and listening for the New York sound. Uh, I, I think there is one. We got a wide selection here. Downtown jazz scene happening. Hey ladies, come here, check this out. Well, New York is like uh, sensory overload, isn't it? It's like colliding sound. It's like car crash or whatever. Energy and anger and angularity and tension and excitement and frenetic quality and drive. color and the speed and the mood and uh, volume, just sheer volume. Anything that happens anywhere seems to happen in New York. I think the unique thing about the New York uh, music scene is that there's so much variety. Um, people come from different backgrounds, from rock, jazz, pop, uh, the art world as well, from punk. From hardcore, right there's new music and world music and basically improvising music. It's uh, hip hop and, uh, and, uh, and Latin disco and um, a lot of easy listening music, a lot of weird things. I'm very interested in uh, putting performance in into music. He said, "Now listen, Chris." My wife is upstairs having a heart attack. This is no time for you to be downstairs scaring the kids. <laughs> underground. So the music existed best as a live phenomena rather than a recorded phenomena. Leaning right on the edge of the precipice of music theater or opera.
you walk two blocks in any direction and you're in a different scene, you're in a different neighborhood, you're, you're, you're hearing a different music coming out of the, the, the houses that you walk by. No doubt in route, you're going to come across between 10 and 15 possibly minorities, although of course I'm not racist or sexist. And they're going to try to get your attention by screaming obscenities at you, which you'll usually then throw a few back of your own, causing possible physical bodily harm to the individual, usually a small white girl. You can walk through the village and you've got jazz clubs, you know, the music coming out of one door, you can go down another door and there's a folk uh, trio singing away in there. Go over to CBGB's and the doors are falling off because somebody's raising a ruckus in there. Cacophony of stimuli going on all the time. All this music seems to epitomize a kind of uh, extremes of emotionality and of dynamic level, uh, a rigidity and formal energy, and um, the drama of living in a city in which so many different cultures and so many different people are crowded in upon one another. Influence, influencing each other and uh, exciting each other. Over the past uh, year, I've had a fixation on thrash metal. Um, sound of people uh, bombarded by media overload. More like dance and funk or uh, music. This Brazilian rhythm with the violin. It's extremely difficult to find a place where you can make noise. Very much more of an expressionist rock. I mean, the music tends to be extreme. Everyone wants something as extreme as possible. The music scene in New York is so dictated by the real estate situation here, which is that I think it's harder and harder for bands and performers to find a place to perform. saying that uh, anything can be music, and it's like, well, how about this, if anything can be music? Music was a side product of what we were doing, which was expressing anger, frustration, and hatred. <laughs> now, uh, as far as the intensity of the city, I don't know, it's like, I don't get it. In the area of experimental music and in the self-conscious interchange between artists and popular musicians, the downtown New York scene is really uh, unique in the United States. Sometimes it's so unique that it produces music that the other parts of the United States find downright weird. Bugs Bunny music. The kind of a trance uh, based music. Reggae. It's not strictly produced, but it's the I dare you to like this kind of music. Leaving as much spontaneity and room for immediacy, room for emotion as possible. And just have all the sounds jumping around together. This really mongrel music, Creole music. Rock in New York. Out of control, rock and roll. money that I need to pay the rent and the willingness to take risks. I mean, sort of put the blood in the music. Um, it, it influences me because it is a filthy place and people consider me a filthy artist. Just, you, can't, you can't sum up what's going on in this city in, uh, in a minute or two. You can't sum it up in a paragraph. Um, there's a certain edge, a certain danger that um, musicians and artists that live here are having their music, which you don't get anywhere else. People who are working in um, new music or extended music or non-commercial music or uh, whatever. And so I find that whatever my, uh, my, my musical Jones is at any particular time, I can find it on some street. Yeah. 
John Zorn. Hi, John. An American improviser who's really into sounds. John Zorn. A leading person in a scene of real co-equals. It's really like this, a, a recombinant kind of view of how music should be made. Every one of these guys who appears in these bands has their own groups, and their own groups contain the same guys that appear in Zorn's group. Originally, when I saw John perform for the first time, it was obvious that this was a guy who was going to be very important. Changed my way of um, doing music and seeing music. And Zorn has been able to sort of scurry in fiddle around, toy with things, move out, stick other things onto it. Yeah, John's a musician to me, and um, his music is really music that can only really come from New York. He's taken elements from, from Eastern cultures, as well as the great American tradition of jazz, and blended with more experimental avant-garde modes as well, which has brought to fruition a very, very diversified kind of sound. There's as much variety in his little pinky than in most of the musicians that I know. When I first saw John Zorn live... He was a master musician, woodwind, a saxophone player, and also incorporated a kind of uh, insanity into the music. Um, I just couldn't believe what I saw. He's got a gift for taking, creating literally an orchestra out of so much different material and so many different musicians. It's sort of like a, you know, kind of a Leonard Bernstein, you know, downtown type. As John Zorn, for instance, who wakes up with music and falls asleep with music. I'm you know, born and raised in New York. I lived in New York all my life. And for me, Spillane is New York. In many ways, he epitomizes the tough detective. Um, in doing an arrangement about Spillane, I researched the subject in detail. I reread a lot of the books. I saw a lot of the films that were made of the books. So in picking him as a subject, I was really picking New York as a subject. And again, I worked on it in moment form. And, and it came out in a series of images. Sleazy stripper, uh, dream scene, bloody murder with a car, uh, stakeout, drinking a cup of coffee, the long wait, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Each moment is kind of relates to Spillane in a very specific way. Sometimes it's an image that I took from one of his novels or a character or a novel that I try to sum up in one musical moment of six seconds long. Sometimes it's, it's um, just something that might happen in his world. Separate images that I then scored as if I was writing a soundtrack. And then with these separate images, I think then began to work on an ordering of them. And I took these cards, each one with uh, a different image and a different musical moment on it, and I began to order it in different ways until I found what I felt was the perfect ordering. And then I went into the studio armed with these cards, which really is what the score amounts to, plus um, a lot of uh, traditionally notated musical material. I work as, as, as a rule in the mornings or whenever I get inspired um, at a small keyboard and I just write abstract music down. Um, sometimes I'll put a, a mood to it, like if one fe it feels mysterious or romantic or whatever. And later, when I was working on, on the Spillane uh, file cards, I'd go through it and find a section that I'd think, hmm, this should have actual written notation for it. I'd go through some of the music that I've been writing around that time, find something that seemed appropriate, and then when we were in the studio and we got to this car and when it was time to record it, I passed sheets out and explained the arrangement you know, I wanted. Their input would be very important and, and ultimately the choice of the musicians is essential. My instructions were do your thing. 
I shut my eyes. Um, I didn't know the song. Um, the only thing I had to go by was uh, listening, looking at the other, um, the other musicians, and especially John Zorn, who would be there, standing in front of my drum kit, wailing on his horn, and uh, gesticulating wildly, occasionally stopping it, say, go, go, something like that. Um, it was quite an experience, and uh, everyone had a good time. It's really movies is what got me into music, and I think that's where there's a real strong connection between film and, and music for me. Um, I saw Fantasia, and I liked the music, and so I went and I bought, like, I liked Mickey Mouse, right? Sorcerer's Apprentice, I bought that. Then I got into Stravinsky, Rite of Spring, and then I saw The Phantom of the Opera with Lon Chaney, and, like, he plays the organ in that movie, you know. So I went and I bought a lot of Bach organ music, and then I heard this record, Coggle, Improvisation Ajouté, this record here. I bought this when it was about, I guess, 15. It's still marked. I got it at Sam Goody in September for 98 cents. And it was just a really crazy piece with guys screaming and hooting and so something about it that really attracted me. And I remember I was sitting at my friend's house. Um, he really liked the Rolling Stones. And uh, I was, I just bought this record and I said, you got to hear this, this is great. And we put it on and he was looking at me like, who the hell are you, are you out of your mind? And his mother was there and she was like, you know, going, oh my God, take this off. And I don't know, at that, right then at that moment, I think that's when I decided this was the music. so much that it's music for film, but it, it's uh, based on our visual culture, on, on, on watching TV and films, and, and being used to uh, having everything ed edited in a uh, very fast manner. I mean, practically my whole life I was brought up on the tube. My mother used to put me in a laundry basket in front of test patterns to shut me up when I was a kid. So the, the television is a really important part of my life, and cartoons, obviously, are strong. In terms of cartoon music, I think really the most interesting, most revolutionary work was done um, in the late 30s and 40s by Warner Brothers in the Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck cartoons that we know so well. That stuff, in terms of time, in terms of the musical time, it, it's, it, it's, no one has even come close to touching that. I don't care how, you know, talk about Cage, talk about Stravinsky or Varese, talk about anybody. No one has dealt with time the way Carl Stalling dealt with it because he was dealing with an image and trying to sync the music up to an image. You take the image away and you're listening to something that doesn't make musical sense. It doesn't have a development the way that other music has development. So it's, it's a very, very special thing that remained in my in my mind. What interests me about Zorn's music is, first of all, that it compares in fascinating ways with the downtown music that just preceded it. It seems to me that he's making a real jump from formalized composition into a kind of improvisatory style that owes a lot to jazz but isn't really like jazz. It's really opened me up to possibilities of, of mixing improvisation with composition. I mean, that's the way my mind works. It, it jumps from one place to another. And you just listen to my music and you can hear it right there. That's my continuity. That's my sense of development. There's stuff that you can get from any kind of music. There's always something there. Uh, country music, classical music. I get ideas from all different kinds of places and get obsessed with different styles of music, like the tanko style I was obsessed with for, you know, a number of years, and now the hardcore, I'm really into hardcore. Japanese pop, I was really into it for a number of years, four or five years ago, and then it kind of took a backseat to something else, which took a backseat to something else. So it's kind of like a constant add-on process. I hear, I hear something in my head, which is a true mixture of, of, maybe jazz and classical and hardcore, 
but I haven't really been able to capture it yet in a band situation. Um, some of the pieces I've written for Naked City come the closest to that. Some of the things that are striking about Zorn's music he shares with rock and jazz, in other words, with rock, the sheer impact that amplification can provide, even for a relatively small group, with jazz, the excitement of improvisatory interchange and the trading back and forth of ideas. And uh, he would, you know, play with Brazilian percussionists or he would play with, uh, you know, a lot of different... Uh, he started playing with some rock people like Ardo, Anton Fear, and he, just trying his thing with many different people. He uh, opened up a new, new way of doing music. Should I pick this up? Uh -huh. I didn't really know what it was like speaking English until I started speaking Japanese. I didn't know what it was like living in New York until I started living in Tokyo. Um, Japan doesn't have a mix of people so much as the culture itself is very mixed. It's kind of built out of stealing a little bit from here, a little bit from there, a little bit from there. They'll take a rhythm from Latin America, uh, you know, a set of chords from somewhere else and, and put their own kind of melody to it, like a Japanese folk melody, or take instruments from around the world and put them all together and, and see what happens. It's just what they like to do. And it's what I like to do in my music, too, so that there's a real connection. I feel very comfortable there. I feel like I'm home when I'm there. Like, hey, dude, what's happening? Yo, man, he can say that in Japanese. When I played in Japan, I'd get booked in some little club or something, and I'd show up with my saxophone, and they'd be pissed. You'd think, hey, well, where are the duck calls? Where are Zorn and duck calls? Come on. You know, he uses the duck calls. He, you know, he's into improvised jazz. You know, the other night he was playing in the band doing the music of Ornette Coleman with Tim Byrne. Well, let's try it from the tempo that, that's counting. Okay. Faster than that. I can't play faster. No, no, no. So either can we. Don't worry about it. Okay. Ornette's music um, was really inspiration, inspirational to me from when I first started playing the saxophone. I've been playing his tunes and practicing them at home, you know, for a long time, 15 years. But eventually over the years, I, through different interests, just moved further and further away from that kind of straight ahead, what you might say straight ahead, uh, uh, free bop interpretation of, of Ornette's stuff towards something that's a little more abrasive, a little more shocking, something that I think is a little more akin to maybe the way people first experienced Ornette back in the late 50s, because it really was a shock. I think there's gonna be a lot of people who hear our Ornette project and say the same thing. What the fuck are these guys doing? This is, this is an insult. But we really love Ornette's music and you know, we feel we're paying tribute to it. So 
I guess I'm trying to approach Ornette's stuff in an acoustic, hardcore kind of way. With a lot of polyphonic improvisation, everybody soloing at the same time or playing together. If I was going to make a list of musicians, that have been important to me, I mean, it would be a mile long. I mean, just look at my record collection, for God's sake. I listen to those records. I better answer that. Oh, okay. Hold on. Yo! Okay, John, we're here. Yeah, well, you're 15 minutes early. I'll be down in 15 minutes. <laughs> Yes. The whole future direction of Zorn is, to me, a real open question. Uh, he could have peaked with these works and sort of burn out from here. He could evolve in the direction of a more conventional composer, to some extent following the, the Phil Glass pattern. Or he could bring his own band structures and use of amplification, use of improvisation and balance of his own notational systems with all that into the world of conventional instrumentationalists, uh, uh, in instruments and, uh, and players, and try to make it redefine that game on his terms. More, more.